Welcome to the Near Judge One Podcast. My name is Isaac Kamins. This is a bi-weekly podcast where my friend Jess O'Brien and I discuss internal martial arts, qigong, and meditation. Uh, this week's episode centers around two people uh, and the creation of the Southgate Bagua School. We first talk about uh, Chen Yo Lung, the son of Chen Ting Hua, and uh, the school he started in the south part of Beijing along with the great uh, master of many martial arts, uh, Liu Duquan. Uh, so we talk about their relationship, the forming of the school, a little bit about their lives, and just sort of how that school developed into what later would be where Liu Hongjie studied. Uh, then in the uh, Patreon portion of the episode this week, we begin our little short series on the spiraling energy body qigong set uh, this is the fire element qigong set in the tradition of bruce francis uh so we talk about that um this week we just sort of give an introduction to it and uh talk a little bit about what it is in the following episodes we'll talk about more the technique itself although it's not an instructional thing so don't get too excited okay hope you enjoy the episode thanks for listening and take care <laughs> Welcome to the Neja Chun Podcast with Isaac and Jess. Um, last time we talked about the death of the great teacher Cheng Tinghua. He's kind of the seminal figure in the Bagua world. And today we wanted to talk a little bit more about his son and the school that was established after his death. So where we left off, Cheng Tinghua had been uh, gunned down during the Boxer Rebellion of 1900. And at that point, his teachings ended and the school falls into the hands of his eldest son, Cheng Yulong. Isaac, I wanted to start from a quote from uh, Power of Internal Martial Arts. So it, it sort of places Cheng Tinghua's school in its historical and physical context. So the, the school of Cheng Tinghua at Chang Wen Men Wai Hua She hosted the largest gathering of Bagua practitioners in Beijing. So this is just one little statement, but it, what he's saying is that this school the Cheng Tinghua established um, here at the Chang Wen Gate, is where a lot of different Bagua people were, were known to habituate and come to this place. So did, when did you first hear about this school that, uh, that our system descends from here that we've been training? Um, I first heard of them when uh, Zhu Baozhen came on the scene because he mentions uh, his teacher, Liu Zheng Lin, who was the instructor there who that Leo Hung Jay studied with. So that's where I first made the connection of that there was this place. And then and Zhu Bao Zen was that elderly teacher in Beijing who was one of the first people to pop up and say he'd heard of Leo Hung Jay and the group that had trained here at this uh Southgate school. Yeah, maybe the only one for a long time. I mean he was the he and Leo Hung Jay were classmates under Liu Zheng Lin. Back in the 60s, yeah, way yeah, back. Yeah, in the mid-early 60s uh, was when uh, Liu Jinglin died. So then later we, you know, Bruce puts it in the book and there are a few other places that it gets mentioned. Uh, uh, people online have mentioned it as being this Southgate Bagua school is sometimes called. And it's just to differentiate it from like um, – other schools of Bagua that were in Beijing, for example, Yin Fu was sort of in the eastern part of the city. Uh, so his school was sometimes referred to as the eastern school, right? I mean, so it just there, there were these like, they just referred to them as kind of directional. Everybody had their own little territory yeah. kind of. So, yeah. and, I, and I think it probably had to do with there were little parks and, you know, everybody had their own little park to like use or, you know space to your practice own, in so little zone of your um, own so this i think it was a flower market or something where right well we have a few <laughs> things here but just in terms of zuba i just want to say like he was teaching forever but like when the internet finally started up in the mid 2000 i don't know 2005 2003 something like that he we finally in the west were able to make more contact with people in china and in the east and so that's when we became aware of yeah. zhu bao zen as being part of this school and sort of affirming that it existed kind of independently and that was pretty cool and one thing we picked up here i, I grabbed a quote uh, cheng tinghua's eyeglasses shop was located near the chung wen gate so that was from some internet article somewhere basically 
the whole Chang group seem to co- uh, coordinate themselves and, and gather around this uh, southern side of Beijing. Um, another article here says, uh, Chang Tinghua moved to Beijing, where he had an eyeglasses shop located next to the Fire Spirit Temple in the Flower Market Plaza. Therefore, he was called Eyeglasses Chang. So this location is tied in with the, his name of Spectacles Chang, as he's always known. And then the further we looked, we found, oh, he's, he's, this is where his eyeglasses shop was located. Right. Chen Yolong, who was the son, was put in charge of this thing. And he was helped out by the elder statesman, Liu Dequan, who was uh, probably at that time, you know, the, one of the most uh, revered people that was still alive because he had trained with... Dong Hai Chuan, he trained with the founder, uh, yeah. the fa- uh, Yang Lu Chan, and he trained with some pretty heavy Xingyi guys along the way, as well as being like a Six Harmonies and a, a Yue Jia Sancho and all these different martial arts, you know. And so he was kind of this, like, I think just sort of, you know, uh, he lots of spear and uh, straight line forms are attributed to him mm-hmm. as well. We'll dig into that in I mean, a second, right? So yeah, yeah, so it's like he he was just kind of this like uh, figurehead. I think maybe a good way to put it. Where right, and Chen Yolong was in charge of the the business, if you will, and uh, they together decided to put Liu Zheng Lin as the sort of you know instructor. And that's who Liu Hong Jae learned from. So it's kind of, there's your connection to our whole thing and how it relates to what we do. Uh, but it also fits into this sort of larger framework of, of you know, the Bagua Zhang sort of family tree. Mm-hmm. And this, there's this whole era, uh, time of ferment of Chinese <laughs> martial arts that from what we've been talking about this whole season, you know, pretty much the year, the late 1800s through the early 1920s, there's a ton of internal martial arts developments taking place. Uh, Sun Ludong, we talked about for a bunch of episodes, writing a bunch of books. The arts are spreading. They've come out of the Royal Palace. Tai Chi and Bagua have come out of the Royal Palace. And they're being taught all over the place. And there's this huge renaissance in Chinese martial arts that's happening during this historical period. This established, you know, the death of Cheng Tinghua in 1900 uh, marks a sort of moment in Bagua history. From then on, his son, Cheng Yulong, takes over the school and teaches until his death in 1928. So I wanted to pull from this old Bagua book in 1933, uh, Bagua, the, the True Transmission of Bagua Fist by Sun Jikun. So this is, the, this is the longest biography of Cheng Yulong, the son of Cheng Tinghua, that I've been able to find. Um, and it's only three sentences. He says, Cheng Yulong studied with his father for many years. His literary skills were excellent. His disposition was upright, cheerful, and curious. He researched each branch of internal martial arts, Bagua, Taiji, and Wu Xing. Without a doubt, he was pure and fine. He had many followers and partners. In November 1928, he died in Tianjin. Later, his burial place was changed to Beijing. The family still teaches his skills. They feel that these skills are unique. So there you have it. That's the most information I have about Cheng Yulong about he, of anywhere. <laughs> he's also uh, sort of given credit as being the creator of something known as Bagua Tai Chi, and I don't mm. know much about it. That's a branch I haven't researched either. Yeah, but, but he's sort of the you know one again. I think he and Leo Duquan were a part of that same. Um, sort of movement that Sun Ludong was part of and that of taking all the the internal martial arts and sort of merging in them into one family and so right here's a quote we got from Loriano's website he says Dong Hai Chuan had already died from various years so Leo De Quan became direct student of Chang and after his death in 1900 helped child Cheng Yulong to establish in 1903 a martial school in the Shimi street of Qianmen Wai of Beijing in the same year, he established Liu Zhenlin as a health teacher. So in that period of confusion, uh, Cheng Yulong, Liu Dequan, and Liu Zhenlin acted as preservers of this Cheng Tinghua Bagua tradition. Right. And that's so com- these three guys are working together to make this school happen. Right. And that's coming from a student of Xu Baozhen that we talked about earlier. 
good. So uh, Leo Hung Jae, according to our calculations, enters the school in 1917, which then closes its doors in 1920. So there's around a three-year period where he's involved with these folks. And more importantly, the people that they brought in and came to visit the school. Right. And then he continues to train with Liu Jinglin and other people that had been sort of you know, around the Mentors. school. But I so basically, our, our whole season two, we've been profiling master after master. All of these guys are people who probably came through this school in some way or another or were connected to it and the people in it. So basically, our whole, you know, one master after another that we've been profiling are folks who are in some way associated with this group. Yeah. And for everyone we mentioned, there's five we didn't. So, right. You know, it's, there's just a I lot mean, of. So the godfather behind this school, the sort of guy in the back who know you know he's is not his picture on the poster but he's sort of the mastermind behind it he's an elderly master at this point he's quite old and he actually we don't even know his birthday leo de Quan was a direct student of the founder of the art bagua Zhang, and then joined in with cheng tinghua after after dong Aichuan passed away um so leo de Quan, we don't know his birthday but we do know his death date is 1911 so the school is established in 1903. So he at least is around for seven or eight years after that. But clearly he's not the one teaching or anything. He's the he's the old guy who kind of, like I said, a godfather type figure who insists that, and sort of pushes for them to keep teaching the art. So it says here he, he's from Hebei province, which is where a lot of martial arts people are from. Um, and in his, his youth, he learns... Uh, a bunch of spear practice. He learns from his master, the golden spear, and eventually he earns his own nickname, long spear Liu. Um, and then after he heads out on the road, he learns uh, even more martial arts methods. Um, and he, so it, it sounds like here, it says at the end of the Qing dynasty, Liu Dequan is summoned to Beijing. Um, and at that time, the top internal martial arts people, are teaching in uh, Beijing. Dong Hai Chuan, the founder of Bagua, Yang Lu Chan, the founder of Tai Chi, were all teaching in the capital. Liu Dequan decided to learn the best of what each teacher to offer had to offer. He studied Bagua directly with Dong. He learned the Yue Jia San Shou free fighting methods with another guy. And then he studied Tai Chi with Yang Lu Chan, the fan founder of Tai Chi, which is must be a whole nother story into itself that we won't dig into. But this guy, Leo Dequan, was there at the start of internal martial arts, basically. So it says that even though he learned some Bagua from Dong Ai Chuen, he was already a skilled martial artist by the time he got there. And most of his instruction came from Dong's student, Cheng Tinghua. Their relationship was more one of friends than student and teacher. So he's kind of a maybe even older than Cheng Tinghua, an older brother, and they hang out and practice together. Um, whereas uh, Leo taught some of his spear and halberd training to Cheng Tinghua, which uh, is preserved in some branches of the school. Um, so anyways, about his personality, Leo Duquan was said to have been a very generous man who was friends with many martial artists of the day. All the elder teachers got along with Master Leo Duquan. He was good friends with many of the famous martial artists of the time, including Zhang Zhaodong, Li Tsunyi, Cheng Tinghua, um, Gong Jishan, a whole list of other guys. He loved, he always loved to study and compare martial arts with his friends. And so that, that bio really speaks to the guy who would then go on to, to sponsor the creation of Cheng Yulong school. And uh, as that gathering place that Liu Hongjie kept saying, this was a school where many different teachers gathered. And I keep emphasizing that because that's kind of not a traditional thing to do. Most schools have their main guy that they follow um, but but Leo Dequan was such a towering figure that he was friends with all the top students of Dong Hai Chuan. So like he's friend, he knows Yin Fu, he knows Cheng Tinghua, he knows all these guys. So like their students come around and visit and hang out and meet up in a way that is pretty unique in martial arts history. You can see that in how he developed his straight line forms and a lot of other stuff because he was part of, you know, this early Bagua group, but he also studied uh, Yue family boxing, which is sort of the pre Xing Yi Chuan Yue Fei family style, which is very much a straight line, sort of simple hand motion kind of martial art. And I, th I like Xing Yi. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and I think that 
the person that Leo Hung Jae learned that from was a student of Liu Duquan's. Mm -hmm. Um, so that there's another connection there and just sort of this thing of, you know, he was, he was one of these very accomplished martial artists in general who taught di a bunch of different martial arts and only, you know, I think later in life kind of synthesized it into this thing that he you know, made his, his own Bagua system based on. Right. Mm -hmm. And so it was kind of all of the things that he knew he put into his own system. At this point, nobody had really got branched out and said, this is my school yet. It was mm -hmm. still like, what did he call it? This gray area or whatever, this period of confusion, right? Mm -hmm. Nobody had really said, okay, well, I'm the Chen Ting Hua school because it was still a bunch of different groups. And that's where I think he was part of what was able to like really center it in this one place is if you got an old guy who knows a bunch of stuff, people are going to be like, well, all right, if he's, if he's willing to, you know, hang out there, then I'll go check it out. Too. Right. There's so, some authority. There's some transmission yeah. going on there that that's attractive in this crew. Yeah. Cause he, you know, he was, well, I think one of these guys like a Sun Lu Dong or a lot of these other guys had, had a love for martial arts just as you know his entire life and it was at the end of his life rather than make it about oh this martial art is the best he, he saw that it was uh better for the future of internal martial arts if everybody worked together i think you know so let me see how well that worked out no, <laughs> <Just kidding. laughs> but yeah you're right though that's the time period when bagua was kind of a new martial art it, it had just been coming out in the last 30 years. So it, it hadn't really split into different factions yet. Everybody just did Bagua because mm -hmm. Dong Ai Chuan had, you know, been around not that long ago. If you, you know, Liu Duquan had known the founder. So, I mean, you're, you're not even one full generation away yet, right? Right. I mean, it's, it's, you're still talking right. about people that would have seen him as almost an equal rather than a, mm -hmm. you know, a, a god or what you right know, right of, and you know, now he's a legend right i mean by the second or third generation he's this almost you know he was yeah, right. the he's shadow walking on water <laughs> well he was just the shadowy figure that nobody yeah. really knows anything about right but right. because nothing was really written down by that first generation we don't really know what they were like right you know neither what, yin fu nor cheng ting wrote their own book it's true right we know by the third generation, people started writing it down. So we know about Yin Fu, we know about Chen Ting Hua, we know about Liu Duquan because of the guys after them writing about them. So it's always a little bit fuzzy as to who you know was where and when and everything because mm -hmm. you're getting different stories from different people. Plus, there's all the translation stuff and dates are always fuzzy. And you know. so it, it, I think the best you can do is try to. Um, look at it a bit like a uh like a biblical lineage you know there's sure. there's some truth to it but other right. also there has some story involved in there too right and so. in, the, in the same sense that someone i i'm from x school you may not have trained with that guy specifically but you learned from the people around him his sets his training methods so it's it, there's a lot of truth to it but it may not be like literally 100 percent true on that exact point or so on <laughs> Right. And if you're, for example, if your teacher uh, learned from six people before the guy that he ends up with, uh, he's going to say, I'm a student of the last guy. Mm. But, you know, all that other stuff is going to trickle in there somehow, too. That's so I sure. think I think where a lot, you know, in, in some sense, Bagua was a easy because of the the sort of shadowy vagueness of of its founding it was easy to put things into it or to mm. add things to it mm -hmm. and expand on it in a way a bit like jazz right you can you can incorporate because there's no fixed structure you can put whatever you want into it and it still works right it's right. still the thing it makes better whatever you put into it basically right. Uh, as opposed to more like a traditional thing like Tai Chi or Shingi, where there's a very specific sort of formula for it. Right. You follow this formula and that takes you to it's the certain skill, place. Right. right. And I, I think that the movement that we're talking about of the synthesis of the three was to kind of 
um, get at the core of all that, how even though these were different things, they were all essentially the same family, right? Yeah. yeah. Going forward, it says here that Leo Duquan built upon the foundation of Baguajong fighting techniques he had learned and created the, quote, 64 hands. Most mar- Many martial arts historians in China believe that most of the Baguajong 64 straight line sets that are taught today in the various systems can trace their roots to the Leo de Quan's Bagua 64 hands. Some report that Liu developed this set when he was employed to teach martial arts to army soldiers. Since teaching the circling motions of Bagua to a large group of soldiers proved impractical, Liu put the Bagua techniques on straight lines so that it would be easier to teach the soldiers. Um, oh. We haven't trained 64 straight lines together, but there are a lot of different schools that have them. Li Ziming school and Gaoisheng school um, others have it too. I, the first school I studied with actually had 32 straight line forms and maybe there had been more of them originally, but that, that was, that was how many had been left over or whatever. I don't know, but uh, there are straight line sets associated with Bagua. And, and like you were saying, Leo de Quan put everything he knew probably into those sets. So there's bits and pieces from everything he had learned his whole life. And then this final creation of a 64 set, um, you know, I'd suspect is a, is a product of his lifetime of martial arts development as seen through that Bagua lens. Yeah, I mean, I'm a bit uh, cynical, I guess. I mean, I look at most straight line Bagua forms and what I see is Tai Chi and Shingy training principles with some Bagua applications put in there. That the movements are generally more like what you would do in Tai Chi and Shingy but with a little bit more of the Bagua philosophy. Sure, that makes that's sense. That's just my opinion. I mean, I, right. I, I'm sure people would argue with me that they're... Um, I mean, in general, I'd say most people agree that the circles are where the principles kind of are, and then the straight line forms are more like applications to, to spark your mind yeah, as to a, how to well, use it. It's, so. I mean, it's, it's generally, I think, thought that, uh, like you just said, it, it applies to teaching large groups of people mm, quick, yeah. quickly right because right one thing you'll say about do you know whether it's she or whatever if you want to teach people to take something to a practical situation you know having them walk around in a circle for five years first <laughs> right <is> probably <laughs> not the best way to go where the quickest just, yeah. just get right into okay here's a hand motion here's a technique uh here's another hand motion here's another technique for example you age asancho is like that um so again that's where i think you know a lot of this stuff came from these sort of very simple martial arts that existed already and as things developed over time more advanced stuff kind of got put into it and yeah for example i mean if you knew a tai chi and shingi before you learn bagua and you wanted to teach people quickly you knew you already knew how to do that method of training where you get people to do static postures to do simple techniques and it also gets people sort of prepared to do the circle stuff in bagua and you didn't have to change you know you didn't have to say that you did three different things. You could just say you did one thing and that the other stuff, you know, the straight line stuff was just part of your training. So it, it allowed you to say, I am a Bagua person and still put people through the, the training that you thought was valuable from your mm-hmm. previous training. Right. You got to start them from the beginning. You can't just give them Bagua. Yeah. You got to give right. them some, some foundations first. Yeah. Mostly because if you started people doing a lot of the twisty stuff in Bagua and if they'd never done anything before, they'd hurt themselves. So right. You want to do yeah, something. You need a basis there. Yeah. And, and I think that's where I think in some sense, Bagua was a little bit backwards and that it probably start because most of the people in the, you know, Dung's students were all, were already accomplished martial artists. They didn't have to go through a basic training. They already could take it and apply it to what they you know, knew and mm-hmm. make their style out of it, as it were. Um, where later on, it was like, okay, well, you need a, you need a, so they had to develop like g gongs and training methods and straight line forms and right. all this other stuff to get the average rube that would come to your class ready to do the stuff that you could or that you know could send him out into the field and get killed right but at least he would have some sense of how to use a spear 
along with you know some some hand technique but it wasn't the you know long-term spiritual development you're going to sit at the foot of the master for 20 years kind of thing that had previously existed i think and maybe later existed after sun ludong pushed the whole idea of it being a meditative approach right because the, sure, the need I, yeah. for bodyguards went down and the need for middle class people to pay for classes went up so yeah i think it i think it goes both came, ways maybe came back to the, yeah that sort of i mean because you again it's this indoor outdoor thing mm. right uh if you're teaching people one-on-one you can morph it to what they need specifically and and their what their talents are and all of this it, but that's not going to get you a whole lot of students right where if you develop a big system uh it's a lot easier to you know if it's systematized and it's level and there's different levels like belts and things like that it's a lot easier to market and to track who's at what level and to kind of make sure that people are sort of going through the thing at the right pace and all right sure Uh, it's the way we're systematized a good example of that in the modern day would be somebody like hungy shang who developed a whole system you know after he went to japan and saw the way the the Japanese schools were organized. So mm-hmm. that's, that's a really smart way to run a martial arts school. And right. so he developed his school kind of bit, you know, even though he's teaching Chinese martial arts, he, he did it in that way. So it, it, it was familiar to people, right? Like it, it, it didn't seem strange and it seemed like, mm-hmm. Oh, that's what I know a martial arts school is supposed right, to. Right, right, right. It looks just how it's supposed so to. So I think it's, you know, it, it's a, it's just a thing that happens in martial arts. Yeah, trends come and go, and and you got to change what the customer wants. If you're looking for hardcore bodyguards to guard a gold shipment on the Silk Road, then that was the Bagua of that era. But then right. Sun Lukong brought out all the stuff about Yi Ching, and now there's oh. new customers who want to do that. Right, and somebody like Liu Duquan, I mean, that's the, in a sense, the like original mixed mm. martial arts, right? I no mean, doubt. these guys were taking... You know, from their perspective, every martial art they could find and trying to merge it into what they knew, there wasn't this thing of like, oh, I do this because it had only been around for you know, 50 years or something like that. So, right. Even less. Yeah. So I think, you know, it's just a, it was this or like I got like that term, you know, this uh, era of confusion because it really mm. was sort of this like if you think about like you know, dust settling or something. There was just a lot of people. It was spreading out. It was landing in different places. People were sort of grouping together in different areas and saying, okay, well, we kind of all do it this way. So let's make a a group that does it like that. And then other people were like, well, we don't really like that part of it. So we're going to keep to ourselves and not be part of your big group. And, 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 but, you know, still not really defined yet. And then by the next generation, you have, you know, labels, right? You have individual brands. Right. Third and fourth brands. generation is going to systematize theirs much more focused on their own thing and, and splitting further away from right. so this schools. So I think this period of like 19, maybe, you know, 1900 to 1928, right. maybe. Yep. That's really where, you know, that, that it was just kind of, and I think that that big tournament in 28 was kind of the, uh, the coming out party, right? To, to say, mm. hey, look, we're still here. We still have, you know, something to offer right. the Chinese people and, you know, all that. Right. And 1928 marks the death of Cheng Yu Long, who's the, the founder of the school with Leo Duquan. Right. And, and on top of what you were saying, there's also the whole uh, warlord period happening. So talk about confusion. It's, it's definitely... Uh, heck of a stretch sure, of history. I mean, <laughs> trying to start a trying to start a martial art school i mean i think that's why another reason why these uh simplified forms and straight line forms and things like that were developed is be and a lot of the weapon stuff probably too was developed because they were still actively using it to oh, fight wow. in battles like it right the, the it's tire- like ukraine and the <laughs> Right. Well, firearms hadn't come on the scene yet. So, you know, knowing how to use a spear and a, and a halbert was useful. Right. I mean, Guns are hard to find in the uh, 1910s and 20s. Right. I mean, you always see it in the, the 
in the movies i mean i think yo jimbo right or whatever where the guy you know one dude with a gun can terrorize the entire town and it takes the hero with the sword who's willing to get shot to, you know to save the day right it's just right. like you know so i, I definitely I, a theme but that was but that was all the way up in you know in china at least i think that was all the way up until you know, the boxer rebellion so at least so here, just to wrap up the biography of Leo Daquan, like many of the Bhagwan Shingi practitioners of his day, Leo put his skills to practical use as the head of a bodyguard service. Later, he was invited to become head of the Beijing Hui Yu bodyguard service. It was in his capacity as a caravan escort that Leo earned his great reputation with the spear. And so to end the story, even when Leo Daquan became very old and his eyesight was poor, he could demonstrate superior martial arts skill. It says here, towards the end of Leo Daquan's life, uh, the eldest son of Cheng, Yulong, Cheng Tinghua was teaching Bagua on Shimo Street. Bagua practitioners would typically come to this area to meet each other and practice. Although Leo and his eyesight were poor, many young students wanted to compare skills with him. Leo used a spear. As soon as the opponent's weapon touched his spear staff, Leo Daquan quickly and effortlessly disarmed the opponents and threw him aside. So this paragraph speaks to the fact that Leo Daquan continued to visit the school of Cheng Yulong mm -hmm. in uh, South Beijing up until his late old age. So once again, another little piece of history showing that masters were coming to this place and interacting and hanging out and training together. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if there was a financial sort of... Sure, you come it, get right? a piece like of action. You, you know, you got... You're supporting the old guy in the exchange, he comes and teaches you. Right. Bit. I mean, that was a common thing that happened in, in with martial right. arts. I mean, still does, right? So absolutely. Um, I think you know, again, multiple sources just saying, you know, he was kind of there. He may not yeah. have, again, may not have been how how much he contributed to the curriculum, who knows? But but he was definitely there and he was definitely, you know there to show off and, and or not show off but to to show people the the sort of uh totality of the art if you will because there's something about when you see an old guy do it that just kind of inspiring as opposed yeah. to you no know, i mean i think when liu Ling got the job he was 23 24 something like that and so when a 24 year old kicks your ass you're like all right oh, i can take that but when an 80 year old kicks your ass you kind of have to rethink what you think about martial arts and if uh, he's blind and he does it with a spear i mean you know that's right. that's like okay well this guy's got something you know and exactly he, yeah it was again just part of making this legitimacy to the whole group and you know yeah it's just you know how martial arts kind of keeps its uh excitement going because you you if you can you see that old guy in the corner and you know every mm. every martial artist i know has a story about an old guy who beat them up and it, it's always a, a, a very uh you know impactful event because you just have like oh i didn't think that was gonna happen and you know, yep it just goes to show that this stuff's got juice that lasts and longevity yeah. behind it for sure all right good session Hey folks, thanks for listening. Uh, just a quick reminder, check out the Instagram for images related to the episodes. Again, check out the Patreon for this week's episode on Spiraling Energy Body. And also leave us a review on iTunes and take care of yourself. Thanks for listening.